Oh, come on, then. That should have got you all stirred up. Are we ready to worship? Come on, church. Let's get ready to celebrate our king. All right, guys, it's going to be a great day. Our Wednesday nights are up and running. we got a lot of things going on. Uh, uh, women, where's Miss Judy at? Where you at? You, she run off. There she is. You ran away. <laughs> well, I'm Judy Stoltz, and uh, we're going to start up the women's Bible study. Um, th th we have a Monday night class starting on the 29th, and one starting on Thursday mornings at 10. Um, we just want y'all to make it. It's on this book, uh, From Beginning to Forever. And we really like for y'all to join us if you can. There you go. All right, we got the men's going. That'll be next. Yeah, oh, yeah, look at that. Next Sunday, uh, get your book going forward. Guys, stay connected to your church. Text TCIP Connect to 94000, and you'll be up to date on everything that's going on. Again, our Wednesday nights are going. I mean, it's going to be a fantastic 2024. Amen. All right, I want to introduce Randy and Tricia Tucker. They'll get our service started. Let's all stand, and let's get ready to praise our king. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Good morning, church. Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Just thank you for this church. Thank you for what you've done in this church. Thank you for all this, the grace and glory and the joy that you bring to our life. Through you, I think everything is accomplishable. We give you everything we got. In your name, amen. Amen. All right, guys, you know the drill. Go make a new best friend. Let's go. Come on. Go say hello to somebody. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. Yeah. 
This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy. Whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I am my Savior, am happy and blessed. and waiting looking above filled with his goodness lost in his love this is my story this is my song Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day. Savior all the day long. Well, good morning, church. As you can see, we are a couple singers short this morning, so y'all are going to have to bear with me for a couple songs. song. I don't want this pain to be my story. I don't want this desert road. Are you sure this is the plan that you have for me? Out here in the dust and clay. God, if there's a bigger picture, it's getting hard to see today. But I know that you won't leave me here. I don't know where this is going. I know who holds my hand It's not the path I would have chosen But I'll follow you to the end Lord, as long as I am breathing I will make your glory known Even if it means I'm walking On this desert road I will follow On this desert road attention now I was doing the talking but now I'm listening this is where my hope is found knowing life is hard but you're still with me I'm not out here on my own you 
are close to the broken hearted Cause you've already walked this road And you're gonna finish what you started souls in need. I got a question for y'all, church. Are y'all awake? Yeah. We're about to wake you up some more. We're about to let it rise. Yeah. 
Let's pray. Lord God, as we celebrate life in your son Jesus this morning, we joyfully give to you unto you what is already yours. Please receive our tithes, gifts, and offering as we pledge our love, devotion, and loyalty to you and your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. dawns in Galilee Some say madman, some say king A wonder-working rebel priest And Jesus Christ the Nazarene And he knew well what it would take Free us all from sin and grief. Perfect man would have to die, and only he could pay that price. Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming. Don't lose hope, cause Sunday's coming. Devil, you're done, you better start running. Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming. So we let those soldiers take him in. As his friend betrayed him with a kiss and There before the mocking crowd Like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sound Then he carried that cross to Calvary And he shed his blood to set us Then he breathed his last and bowed his head, the Son of God, and man was dead. With bloody hands, tears on their face, they laid him down inside that grave. But that wasn't the end. That wasn't the
now Jesus reigns upon the throne all heaven sings to him alone and we watch and wait like a bride for a groom oh church arise he's coming soon Good morning to the church in Peaster. Maranatha. Maranatha. Want to add another one to that word today. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. So Maranatha. Maranatha. Emmanuel. Emmanuel. Remember those two phrases or those two words. We're continuing our, our series on speaking Jesus. The world is saying a lot right now. There's a lot of voices that, that the church can listen to. We're being tempted to listen. Today is really weird, Okay. Uh, because we're going to describe a story for you, and I've broken it down, don't panic, that's rather lengthy. Matter of fact, it's j the beginning of it is j just the beginning, it's three chapters in Isaiah. We'll get there in a moment. But uh, what I wanted to say about it, is the reason that most of us have never heard this story before is because it's extremely confusing. If you just start out let, let me give you an example. I want you to turn, please. we're not going to, may not even have to bring it up because I wasn't planning on doing it this soon. But in the story really begins in Isaiah chapter 7. So let me just read you the first verse of Isaiah chapter 7 to kind of make my point. Now it came about in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, the king of Judah, that Rezin, the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. Now that makes no sense to anybody. You're going, so because you read verse 1 of chapter 7, you probably just were smart and went, I'm not interested. So we don't know this story very well. So let me give you a quick history on what's going on, and it'll at least make sense to you on why this is so. See, people say the scriptures today are irrelevant, that they're not contemporary, that they're not up to date, that they're all antiquated. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible, the scriptures are so far ahead of society, it's ahead of politics, it's ahead of religion, it's, 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 just, it's just ahead of everything. So once you really start to believe that, it's provable by reading the scriptures and seeing how relevant. We're going to talk about such a relevant uh, thing today, although it happened over 2,700 years ago, because history repeats itself. History will always repeat itself. So if we can look at the scriptures, even in the Old Testament, which all is about Jesus anyway, you see, it's called an archetype. Some people call it an archetype, but I call it an archetype. We're going to define that in just a moment. So again, well, let's go ahead and do it now. Archetype. What is an archetype? The, this is right out of the dictionary. It's not mine. Right out of the dictionary. The original pattern or model of which all things of the same type are represented. For instance, if you, let's just leave that up there if you would, Miss Debbie. Uh, let's just take Passover, for instance. Passover is one of the first archetypes. You had to get, get a lamb. Jesus is the lamb. You had to shed its blood and wipe its blood on the door. And that blood is from the blood of the lamb. And if you get inside that door, you're protected from death and harm that night when the death angel passes over. So there, and Jesus used archetypes all the time. Even when talking to Nicodemus, he said, you remember when, when Moses raised the serpent in the wilderness. And so, what you're, and so Jesus said to Nicodemus, what you're seeing there is what I'm going to accomplish over the next three years. I will die on a cross. And then Nicodemus, with all of your religiosity about you and your religious understanding, you will understand what, what, what's happening when you see me on that cross. And that's exactly what happened as Nicodemus was one of the two men who took Jesus from the cross that afternoon at 3 o'clock. So archetypes are extremely important. And I think this one that we're going to be looking at today is one of the most valued because of its timing in world conditions. See, right now, world conditions are awful. Amen? I mean, I'm not going to, you know, you know, you live it just like I do every day. So I'm not going to go in and start saying well, this is wrong. And, but it's just bad. I mean, it's just bad. The situation in Isaiah was exactly like it is today. 
So until you understand a little bit of the history of what is going on, you don't, none of this is going to make sense to you. These, what's interesting to me is that these people that are mentioned, let me give you their names again right out of that verse 1 of chapter 7. In the days of Ahaz, remember that name. The son of Jotham, you don't have to remember him. The son of Uzziah, you don't have to remember him. All right, he was the king of Judah. Now, what does that mean? Now, this is 733 B.C. What we're about to describe is what is called the Syro-Israelitish War. It's, it's also interesting that not only is this war recorded in 1st and 2nd Kings in detail, but also in 1st and 2nd Chronicles. But more interesting than that is that all of the names that I'm about to tell you are registered in ruins all across modern day Iraq and Iran. The name, these names are there. They were kings. We have In other words, we have outside sources with these kings riding on pyramids and monuments and and gravestones. They're still there today. They find them all the time. And all of these names are mentioned, and it's lined up perfectly with what the Scriptures say, who was aligned with who and who was at war with who. So it's not just something that happened a long time ago that maybe it's kind of a fable. No, no. I deal in fact. The Scriptures are factual. Every word is fact. And people have been trying to disprove them for years, but they haven't done it yet. What does that tell you? Some of the greatest minds, totally antithetical to Christ, have tried to disprove this word, this this written word, this account. Why do you think they call it history? His story. History. It is, all of history has to do with Jesus. All of this book, called what we call the Bible or the Scriptures, is all about the coming of the Messiah from Genesis to Revelation. So let me describe to you what's going on and who is who here. It's very important. Listen in. There was a, when, when, when Solomon died, the king of Israel died, there was a civil war between Israel and itself. Ten of the tribes went to the north, and they called that northern kingdom, wrongly I think, but they called it Israel. Two of the 12 tribes went to the southern region, what was called Judea or Judah. Those two tribes compromised, uh, uh, comprised of Benjamin and the tribe of Judah. So this war, and then they had capitals. The southern, uh, the southern country of Judah had Jer- Jerusalem as its capital. The northern kingdom of Ephraim, or what is called Israel, sometimes it's called Ephraim, its capital was in called a city called Samaria, about 40 to 50 miles apart across the border. And they hated each other. The way that you became king over the northern kingdom was through assassination and conniving and lying and death and murder and poisoning. That's the way you, it was all political. That's the way you became king of the northern kingdom of Israel. The way that you became king of the southern uh, kingdom of Judah was you had to be in the lineage of David. You had to be in the line of the kingship. That, that preserved that when Jesus was born, he was born in Bethlehem or in Judah, which meant made him of the tribe of Judah. He was in line with the sovereignty of the nation. Okay? So God is preserving. Now, the ones in the, to put it in West Texan, the ones in the north are bad, the ones in the south are good. But that's not to say that all the southern kings in the lineage of David were good kings. We're dealing with a very bad king, even though he was in the lineage of David as king of the southern kingdom of Judah. His name was Ahaz, not Ahab, that's another one. He ruled in the north. Ahaz is a king with royal blood in him. Who they all know he is the he is the standard bearer until he dies, he gives his sons, and the lineage will continue until the Messiah is born. Then you have Syria, who was north and east of the northern kingdom of Israel. They were always at war with Israel and Judah. Just making sense? Syria was they were a minor country, but they were always invading. They're, they're just constant warfare all the time. That's the backdrop for this story that we're about to describe. 
economic conditions were awful in all three uh, in all three empires in the north of Israel, bad guys, south Judah, good guys, sometimes still in the line of David, and then Syria. They hated each other, and then one day the following happened, and I have I have entitled my message today, "Speaking Jesus Then and Now." The same Jesus, the same God who spoke about Jesus in the Old Testament. See, let, let's just bring up the quote r- real quick if we can. And here's what I said in my opening quote. As God cannot change, and that's called immutability in, in religious terms. If God, as God cannot change immutability, the antiquity of the Old Testament prophet's words can still apply to the contemporary church. What you're about to see is a description in modern times of something that happened 2,700 years ago in 733 B.C. The the conditions were awful. The economy had totally dropped off. Everybody was at war. the, The priesthood had totally fallen into collapse and despair. Nothing was, nothing was good. The people were starving to death because of the governments that had been waging war against each other for so long. And then one day this happens. We're going to begin reading in in Isaiah chapter 7. It came about, and now it's going to make a, a little bit of sense. It came about in the days of Ahaz, now remember him, son of Jotham, the son of Uriah, the king of Judah, that's in the southern kingdom, that Razin, the king of the Arameans, or Aram, that's Syria, and Pekah, the son of Ramallah, king of Israel, so Pekah's not good right off the bat, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. So what we've got is a Syrian and Israeli alliance to wage war against Judah and take over Jerusalem. Okay, make sense now? When it was reported to the house of David, that's Judah, the house of David, Ahaz, saying the Arameans, that's the Syrians, have camped in Ephraim, that's also called Israel. It's right, it, they're at your border is what it's saying. His heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with wind. Then the Lord, see, no matter what's going on, church, listen, we're going to get into the church heavily today and its importance and who is it, who is she, and why do we come to church? What's the the point of it all? Because in essence, we are the remnant. We are the standard bearers of the kingdom of God. We are the final word as the Messiah is concerned, the church. And God is not an adulterer. He will not work outside of his church to do great things. He will use the church in very awful times to be a light to a very dark world. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, go now to meet Ahaz, who was what? The king of Judah. You and your sons, Shair Jeshub, and that name means a remnant shall return. Amen? It's all prophetic now. Meet him at the end of the conduit. That conduit, that tunnel is still there today. It's 1,753 feet long. It still goes from the same pool, goes in under the gates, and feeds the water of Jerusalem. So this conduit is even, you can walk through it if you take a tour of, Jerusalem, of Israel. The end of the conduit at the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field, still there today. And say to him, say to Ahaz, this is a prophetic word from Isaiah, take care and be calm. Take care We know the enemy is at the gate, but take care and be calm. We know we've got all kinds of problems, church, but I'm telling you, take care, be calm. Jesus said over and over and over again in a very bad situation, fear not, I am with you always, even until the ends of the world. And say to him, say to Ahaz, this is Isaiah speaking prophetically now, verse 4, Take care and be calm, have no fear, and do not be frightened because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands. In other words, they're not a hot fire, buddy. They're nothing more to God than just smoldering firebrands. Don't sweat it. Don't worry about it. I am your guard, your your forward guard, your rear guard. I am there for you at all times. Because, verse 5, because Aram, that's the Syrians, with Ephraim, that's Israel, and the sons of Ramalia, 
has planned evil against you, saying, this is what they wanted to do. This is what the enemies of Judah and Ahaz wanted. Verse 6, let us go up against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabil. That's a Syrian name, so it wouldn't have even been Jewish. As we don't know who he was, but he's not even Jewish. That is a Syrian name. So they didn't want to take over and destroy the city. They wanted to change its authority, its kingship, to being Syrian instead of in the lineage of Messiah. But verse 7, thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Then I'm going to skip verse 8 because it, it, it says the same thing. But let's look down at verse 9. And the head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is the son of Ramaliah. And here's what I wanted to get to. If you will not believe, he's talking to Ahaz now. Ahaz, if you don't believe me, you shall surely not last. The church is made and put here today to be the final word concerning God and his kingdom. That's just the truth of the subject. Now we, we pick up with verse 10. Watch this. Because in all the, all the things, all the bad things happening, and all the murders, and all the war, and all the economics, and all the politics, and all the false doctrines being taught, look at verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again through Isaiah to Ahaz, the king of Judah, saying, Ask a sign for yourself, Ahaz, from the Lord your God. Make it deep as hell or as high as heaven. Here is this prophet, Isaiah, the, the greatest prophet in Israel's history, looking at Ahaz with, with such confidence that he literally looks at him and says, the Lord told me that you can ask anything you want for a sign that you're going to be okay, and he will do it. Just ask, Ahaz. And it looks like Ahaz's answer is pretty spiritual. But it's not. It's awful. In the original language, it's awful. What he basically says is, watch how he tries to hide his spirituality with God talk. Verse 12, Ahaz said to Isaiah, I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now, it's very interesting. This is not the prophecy concerning Jesus the Messiah. There was a literal child, a child of Isaiah that I believe this to be, and most scholars do too. But I can't, I don't have the time to get into that. But it's still an archetype because what we're, what we're used to reading with Emmanuel comes in just about five minutes. So this is still an, archi an, an archetype, but it's, it's con see, all prophecies, all prophecies that you can give me, they have a contemporary meaning and they have a future meaning. So God is speaking to Ahaz about Emmanuel. And what does the word mean? God with us. God with us. And this is what Isaiah is saying to Ahaz. Look, Ahaz, you can panic all day long because of all that's going on around you. But do you not understand that God is with us? Emmanuel. The church has to understand that principle first and foremost. No matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what's happening around us, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how many people have thrown in the towel, the church has to say, don't you understand? God is with us. We have to, but we have to believe that first. I'm still convinced that most Christians do not, deep down in their hearts, believe that. That God is, the church will never be destroyed. God is with it. We may be driven underground. We may not be able to come in comfort someday. I hope we are, but that's probably not. But God how do you think the church in China survives with 30,000 converts a day and they're an outlawed religion? Because they know one thing that we need to learn. God is with them. 30,000 a day, it is estimated, are converted to Christ in China. And it's all an underground church because Christianity is outlawed in that nation. But they have a belief that we need to adhere to. God is with us. What verse was I in? I'm going to start at verse 10. <laughs> then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz through Isaiah, saying, Ask for a sign 
for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as hell or Sheol or high as heaven. Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I. He'd given up. He'd already given up. And then Isaiah said to Ahaz, listen now, O house of David, to Judah, that's the house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she shall call his name God with us. He will eat curds and honey at the time. He knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. For before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land who the two kings you dread will be forsaken. Then there's going to be some trials coming. Now we're going to jump to chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Same story. Again, the, the, uh, the Lord spoke through Isaiah to Ahaz further saying, Inasmuch as these people, in other words, your kingdom, Ahaz, have rejected the gently flowing waters of Shiloh. What, Shiloh means shalom in, in its original Hebrew, and from shalom is where we get the word peace. So the people were so scared and so terrified by what was going on around them, they had no peace. They were not drinking from the waters of peace anymore. The water, and how many times does Jesus say, I came that you might have peace and, and life and have it abundantly. Drink from the waters that I give to you. Drink from these waters and you can have peace, especially to the church. I'm speaking to the church as a whole now. Now it really gets interesting. Let me start over in verse 6. Inasmuch as these people have rejected the gently and flowing waters of peace, and rejoice in Razin and the sons of the son of Remaliah. In other words, they started believing that he's going to be our new leader. He's the king of Israel, but once they invade us, he's going to destroy us all, and we'll have a new king. Verse 7, now therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of Euphrates. This is awful, because it, it makes no sense. I'm fixing to explain it to you. Watch this. Even the king of Assyria and all of his glory, it will rise up over all of its channels and go over all of its bank. Then it will sweep on to Judah. It will overflow and pass through. It will reach even to the neck. And the spread of its wings will fill the breath of your land. Oh, God with us, or help us, God. Now, what happened was, and it's the same thing that can happen to the, a, a nation that turns its back on on Messiah, but it certainly can happen to a church who turns its back on the atonement doctrine. I think it happens every day. What he just said was, okay, Syria and Israel and Judah, y'all, it's going to be really bad. And y'all are trying to make alliances to take over Judah and put Tehill on the throne. That's what you're worried about. But what, what is going to happen to you is the greatest empire in the world at that time, the Assy not Syrian, but Assyrian empire, modern day Iraq and Iran, are going to so overflow you, it's going to be like a flood, and he's going, and Assyria is going to be like the river, Euphrates. It's going, like it floods and goes up and down all the time. This flood's going to come in from the northeast and just wipe you out like a tsunami. So while you're worried about other things and trying to devise plans on how to get out of your present situation, there's going to be another power coming in that's going to slam you like a wave and destroy all of you. you none of you will survive the Assyrians. Does that sound familiar today? We become so distracted on smaller issues that there are, God will say, if you, don't, if you don't believe me, if you don't believe me through this, if you don't trust in me, if you don't have faith in me, I'll let somebody come along to finish you off. Because of, not because he's mean or unjust or not unholy, but because of disbelief in who he is. And the same thing can happen to a church. If we get so wrapped up in other issues, God will send a tsunami at us that will basically, the, now the church will get, might not be the one that he sends a tsunami over, but I've seen hundreds of churches in 50 years of preaching that have split right down the middle. I remember one time in Abilene, I went out to a small, this was in 1975, and I went out to a church, and what you did back then, you went to your home church and you signed up. If you were a preacher boy like I was in 1972, just starting out, you would sign up and they would, they would call you uh, 
and say, we need a, a preacher for that particular Sunday morning. And since you're just beginning, we're going to let you, you know, impress us. Well, I went to this small church in Amelie. Don't remember the name of the town, couldn't tell you. But it was out in the desert. And I drove for a long time to get there on Sunday morning. I didn't go and stay in a hotel the night before. <laughs> and I walked up thinking, this is, this is a typical, and I'm from West Texas, so I'm, but this is a typical West Texas town. Okay, it was hot, it was dry, there were dogs barking, and you know, it looked like they all had rabies and <laughs> cactus everywhere. But I went to the church, and it was gorgeous. It wasn't very big. It was probably half the size of this or a third of the size of this auditorium. But I mean, it was immaculate. I even walked through a white picket fence to go up the cobblestones where there was a bell. And it looked just like, it looked like a Norman Rockwell painting. So I go in and right off the bat, I'm pretty impressed. I'm thinking, okay, now, okay, I'm not preaching in front of three today. There's going to be more than that it looks, because they know how to take care of the church. So obviously somebody's coming. And the service was probably at 11 o'clock. That's what time most church services had started back then. So I got there at about 1030 thinking, well, nobody's here yet. Finally, at 11 o'clock, if that's the starting time, and I'm sure it was, at 11 o'clock, I'm sitting on the front row and nobody's come in. Nobody. Nobody. Well, I'm sitting there, and finally, a little old lady, she was probably early 80s, mid-70s, early 80s, she came walking in, and she said, <coughs> are you Reverend Anderson? Well, I didn't, never been called that before, and I thought, well, no, 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 I'm just John, but yeah. She said, well, what's our subject today? And I told her what it was, whatever that was subject that day. I guaranteed it had to do with the cross. And she sat there, and she said, well, you can start anytime you're ready. And I said, this one woman. And I said, you mean that? She said, that's it. And I, I, I was stunned. I couldn't believe it. I said, what? Who built this? She said, about 10 years ago, a revival came through. And everybody in this town got saved. I'm telling you, it was amazing. And some very rich oil people came in who had, you know, oil rights. And they built this church for us. And we filled it up for a couple of years. But then everybody started fighting and everybody started wanting their way and everybody thought we should be this and others thought we should be that. And there was that root of bitterness that began to come into the church and she said, I'm the only survivor of the fight. I'm the only survivor of the fight. So I know it can happen. I've seen it with my own two eyes, even though that was a long time ago. What verse are we in? Anybody know? Okay, because now we're going to get, let me, let's just, let's, yeah, verse 9. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Let's go to verse 9 of the same chapter. Be broken, O peoples, and be shattered, and give ear all remote places of the earth. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. Gird yourselves, yet be shattered. It's a, he, he doubled up on that saying. Watch what he says now, because everybody has a plan on how to get out of our problems, other than turning to God. Everybody's got a plan on what they think they should do to get us out of this mess that we're in as a nation and in a church and in a world. So everybody's got a plan. Watch. Verse 10. <clears throat> Devise a plan. It, won't, it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand. For God is with us. He's talking to his, to the, to his own remnant now, to his own family. Go ahead and do what you will. Do whatever it takes, what you think is going to fix this mess. But God is with us. And I think it's safe to say the same thing about an on-fire church for Jesus. No matter what happens around us, no matter what's going on that's bad, God is with us. Why? Because he said he would be. And he cannot lie and he cannot change his mind. People say all the time, you believe there's things that God can't do? There's lots of things God can't do. He can't lie, can't deceive, cannot not love you. I hope you're not an English teacher. So there's a lots of things. Can't die. Not anymore. That's all over with. Now, it, now because what caught my eye on this is, is the next verse and the next word. Watch it, because you've probably never seen this before. 
For thus the Lord spoke to me, Isaiah talking about himself, with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, this is God now talking to Isaiah. This is what God told Isaiah. Watch. Isaiah, you're not to say, it's a conspiracy in regard to all that this people call a conspiracy. Isaiah, you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. Isaiah, you're above that. Walk with me. Trust me. Love me. and You and your family will be okay no matter what else is going on because it changes all the time. Verse 13, it is the Lord of hosts whom you shall regard as holy. Here's the church. This is what the church needs to adapt. And and individually, we need to adapt these verses. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy, Isaiah. And he shall be your fear and he shall be your dread. (coughs) Then, if you do it that way, Isaiah, God will become a sanctuary. But to both the houses of Israel, that's Israel and Judah, He'll be a stone to strike and a rock to stumble over and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Many will stumble over them. Then they will fall and be broken, but they will even be snared and caught. So conspiracy caught my, it's only used here twice in the scriptures. But there's another word that even caught my attention even more as I looked over this story and was trying to discern what's going on here. After this Word to Isaiah that everything's going to be all right to those who fear God and those who love him and those who stay faithful and loyal to him. Look, look at verse 16 and notice a word that you've never seen in the, in the Old Testament before. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. What's the word? Disciples. This word's only used three times in the Old Testament, and all three times Isaiah uses the word disciple. Nobody else in the Old Testament, they use followers or people or whatever. Nobody uses this term. This is so far ahead of its time. Bind up the testimony. Seal the law among my disciples. It must be sealed in our hearts how we feel about God. We must be determined to follow him no matter what's going on around us, no matter what our present, because your present situation is going to change tomorrow anyway. And you'll move on to, to another fear and another problem and another disaster and another conspiracy. It's going to change all the time. But what must remain stable is our love and our dedication and our loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his kingdom. Now, we go all the way down. I'm just about done. Now, now comes the second antitype or archetype. It's, it's all the same thing. Sometimes I'll say antitype or archetype or archetype, okay? It's all the same word. But watch what happens to those in the remnant who believe with all of their hearts that God is in control of all things. But there will be no more gloom for her, that's the church, who was in anguish. In earlier times, God treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later on he will make it glorious by the way of the sea. See, that's the northern kingdom, and God just just always was judging them because they were always against Israel. Watch what happens here. He just said the land of Naphtali and the land of Zebulun, that's in Galilee. That's in the northern kingdom at, at this time in Isaiah. That's the northern kingdom of Israel. And God just detested them because they weren't in the line and they were always doing war with his people in Judah. There will be no more gloom for her who was, who was in anguish. In earlier times, God treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt, but later on he will make it glorious by the way of the, oh boy, oh boy. Mm. By the way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. They will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you will break the yoke of their burden and their staff on their shoulders, the rod of their oppressors as at the battle of Midian. That's the 300 men of Gideon, remember him? 
For every boot of the booted warrior in the battle tumult, the cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for fire, no more war. It'll be just, their, the cloaks that they wear, their uniforms will be nothing more, but they'll be using it to burn fires and have a good time around. For, a, for why? Verse 6, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of his peace. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From then on and forevermore, the zeal, the zealousness of the Lord will accomplish this. So that no matter what's happening around us, God will accomplish what he just said. As a matter of fact, he's already given us the true Emmanuel, Jesus the Messiah. One last thing. I want you to turn, please, to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 29. Ecclesiastes you say, what a strange place to go. Yes, it is, but you're going to see it real quick. One verse. Behold, I have found only this. This is what he says, Solomon says here at the end of his life. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. I looked up, I have a translation of 26, uh, it's 26 versions of the Bible in one book. It's very thick, but there's 26 versions. And I went through that book and I said, I wonder what the word device means in this. So this is what the word means. Some in, translate it this way, conspiracy, contrivance. Many will come up to with conspiracies. Many will come up with contrivances. Many will come up with mental inventions. Many will come up with plans of their own devising. Many will come up with many more calculations. Don't worry about it. Do what you can, but don't fear. God is in control of his world. Not some political party, not some world nation. God is in control. But he will judge us. But I hope that he judges this church as one who loves him, who has faith in him, who goes through the same things that other people go through. But we still come to church on Sunday mornings. We still love him and praise him and glory in his name. If we do that, we can overcome any evil that's thrown against us. I still believe that the greatest days of this church are in our future. But it's going to take a lot of courage and it's going to take a lot of faith and it's going to take a lot of belief to know that we are God's people and that he will not forsake us. That even the gates of hell will not prevail against us in the worst of times. In the name of Jesus the Messiah, I say that. Amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Wednesday nights are a blast. Come in here this six, at 6.30 this Wednesday night with me. I think you'll find it interesting. And we're having a great time. Now let's read our, let's end by reading our scripture for the day, our blessing for the day. Let's all stand. If you're, vi any visitors today, first time visitors, anybody, can I see your hand? Yep, thank y'all for, where are y'all from? Spring, oh, the foreign country of Springtown. Yeah. Way over there. What we call East Texas. I hope you felt welcome here today. Ready to read it? Here we go. And without faith, oh, that, no, that was awful. Let's read it like we mean it. Let heaven hear it. Let the angels just smile to them. Let's give the angels something to smile about this morning. Are you ready? And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. That's a promise. Don't forget it. Maranatha.